And that led me to a book by doctors Westman, Finney, and Vola. I learned the Atkins diet has evolved and now... That's me. Oh my goodness. Is a low carb diet dangerous long term? Vegan versus keto debate. I'm Dr. Eric Westman, and this is another Dr. Westman Reacts. I'd like to officially announce that the Keto Made Simple Masterclass from Adapt Your Life Academy is now open for enrollment. To see exactly what you get in the Keto Made Simple Masterclass, click on the link in the description. It's open for enrollment for a limited time only. I hope to see you there. I got sent this video from Plant Based News. I think I, we might suspect some plant-based bias, but, but uh, let's see. It's in the name, right? Uh, is low-carb diet dangerous long-term? Now, this is a rather long one, but I think it's important to go through because this is a particularly persuasive, non-scientific point of view. And I, I really, we want to focus on the science, but, but it's hard to do that when people are persuading you with other means, uh, particularly the ad hominem fallacy, which is if you, you can't debate the substance, you attack the person, the, you know, the, the morality or, the, or how long they live, perhaps, is, is what we'll see here. You know, so is that really science? Uh, let's check it out. A couple of months ago, I got curious about how long health influencers live. So I made an episode about 24 health gurus I was familiar with. One disturbing pattern that emerged was how young the low-carb dieters were when they died. I thought surely that must be a small sample. Well, let me just stop right there on the picture uh, with Dr. Atkins. Actually, um, I think he, yeah, he died at 72, I believe. Uh, I had just asked for research money from him and he slipped on the ice in New York City. And uh, it was an untimely snowstorm in, uh, in New York City and uh, was found having bumped his head. So <laughs> one thing I, I took away is you want to live in an area where there's no ice if you want to live longer. You know, it, it wasn't the diet that, that uh, that caused him uh, the, well, <laughs> I met with a doctor group after that and they said, oh yeah, he had a heart attack and then he slipped on the ice. What has me always uh, questioning in my mind is, is, does that individual really need an approach that minimizes the glucose and insulin? In other words, if, if someone sought out that way of eating, they may have had some underlying condition that made them at higher risk. So for example, if someone comes to my office, they have 200 pounds to lose and they do a keto diet and they, they lose that weight. Uh, they would not have done so well on an approach that didn't lower the glucose and insulin, you know, helping this person by diet alone. So there are, there's always that selection bias. Um, if you grew up healthy and you're, you're, you know, active in the gym and you were, you played professional sports, that's a different kind of background, different kind of metabolism than people who gravitated toward, uh, well, grew up chubby and heavy and then gravitated toward books and, and learning in, um, in a, a, a different way. Uh, so the selection bias always has me, uh, would love to have a prospective study to see even randomized people. So you take away that selection bias of why did someone want to do um, a certain approach. And I, I do know the story that's told about Dr. Atkins is that he had a weight problem himself and a voracious appetite. So the first diet that Dr. Atkins ever did was a shrimp diet. So it wasn't bacon, it wasn't you know meat, red meat and all this. It was actually seafood that he was eating personally. But anyway, again, I don't, I don't want too much emphasis to be put on one individual or, or, but let's see now if the argument here holds up for groups. Surely that must be a small sample size thing. So last month I did an episode with 60 more and spent a lot of time searching for low carb influencers. I was encouraged to find people like Dr. Ephraim Cutter, a carnivore who lived to 84, but still the same pattern emerged. That really bothered me. I thought people would legitimately point to low carb influencers who lived well into their 90s and my credibility would be shot. You scary bitch, didn't you? Show the people you're sponsored by Big Buckley! You're biased, mister! 
So I tripled down on my search and at first I kept discovering the same things. For example, Benjamin Spock became a household name. He looked amazing at 94, but he was vegan. He famously said all children over two years old should be vegan. I was looking for long-lived low-carbers. In this episode, I'll take you on my quest. I found some and I'll end with what I think allows some low-carbers to live long while others die way too young. So again, we're, we're going backwards in time, not really knowing what people uh, really ate. Um, and then uh, I wonder if Jack LaLanne is in there, although uh, how do you define low carb? I remember reading that he didn't have sugar. He dropped sugar very early in life, although he's known as the exercise guru for a generation. I think he lived to 99. So uh, the other thing that kind of pops up is if there are more uh, if there are more influencers on the vegan side, just influencers, then, then there are low carb, then you're just going to get more people to populate that, that area of your spreadsheet that, you know, there's just more people who talk about it than if there are more lar low carb people in the closet, so to speak, who don't publicly say anything, uh, then you're, you're going to get a bias just because of the number of people who publicly say it. I do have to say that, that the, the vegan advocacy and, and, you know, go vegan, that sort of thing has a certain element uh, that's, um, I think, much more uh, 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 prominent than the low carb, uh, at least in the last 20 years. The, the, there weren't low carb, you know, uh, go low carb sort of uh, people that, that I'm aware of that, that had the same element in the society social way of thinking. Um, so that may bias you toward getting just more people who are, who declare themselves as vegan. One thing's for sure, there was a boom in low carb diets in the 50s and 60s. For example, this is Dr. Stillman's 4 million copy best-selling low carb diet book published in 1967. There is no instruction to count calories. You can eat as much of the fine foods on the list as you need to satisfy your hunger. A great variety of lean meats, unfatty fish and seafood, chicken and turkey, eggs, cottage cheese, and farmer's cheese. He died of... Well, that's what I teach my patients today. So I know he looks incredulous and, and I've heard people read that and say, therefore, it's silly. No, it just works in a, a different way. So... Um, I'm not sure what the point was there. That's just how you teach a real food based low carb diet that lowers the glucose and insulin, which I think is the commonality of all healthy ways of, of eating that healthy lifestyles. Cheese. He died of a heart attack at 79. Another was the English complaint by Dr. Franklin Bicknell, a low carb diet book that sold well in 1952. He died at 53. Arnold DeVries wrote prim. So, People get in car accidents and, and don't blame it on a diet. Well, although if you remember back, Dr. Atkins slipped on the ice in New York City and I gave a talk and one of the doctors said, well, he had a heart attack, then he slipped on the ice. So, I mean, you can always add in that layer. But uh, if living in a Western society with stress and, you know, remember the type A personality as a, a risk factor for heart disease, so, uh, sometimes I think diet is made up to be more important than it really is in some people. Uh, and right now I, I go to the level of measuring people's individual arteries. You can have personalized medicine such as the fact that you can get a, a read on your own arteries without someone predicting whether you have it or not. So the, the other interesting thing is we're at a stage like where the, the horses are coming out of the gate and, and we're measuring people and they, we don't know what the future will bring, but we can actually measure the blood and the arterial system as people are progressing. Um, but, you know, the, I can just, you know, oh, he died of a heart attack. Therefore, it was the diet. Well, it's more complicated than that. You know, did they smoke? Uh, that, you know, I remember my parents' generation, everybody smoked and doctors were promoting smoking. So it's more complicated than that. Was there metabolic syndrome, meaning the high triglyceride and the low HDL, that even today drugs don't have a great, at least statin drugs, don't have a great answer for. That's called residual metabolic, cardiometabolic risk. Uh, but let's go back to these diet books. Primitive man and his food in 1952 and died at 74. 
I can't believe I forgot to mention Carlton Fredericks when I was recording in the kitchen and before I jetted out here to Utah. He was a good friend and mentor to Dr. Atkins and wrote this low carb diet book in 1965, which was very popular. He had a syndicated radio show for 30 years, five days a week on low carb dieting. If you are what you eat, I suggest you're an awful mess. He lived to 76. Also Eustace Chesser, a popular book author who wrote the book Slimming for the Million in 1939. He died at 70. Okay, back to the kitchen. Then there were the paleo diet pioneers. Walter Volklin wrote The Stone Age Diet in 1975 and died at 71. Stoffen Lindeberg wrote Food and Western Diseases and died at 66. Boyd Eaton wrote The Paleo Description and died at 82. And Leon Chaitow, who wrote another Stone Age diet book, died at 81. There were fitness gurus like the bodybuilder Vince Deronda, who wrote the low-carb book Unleashing the Wild Physique in 1977 and died at 79. I even went time out. <laughs> it looks like this fellow was using something other than diet. I, I don't know that that can be done without uh, some other enhancement of, of medications. Uh, but um, I guess I, I'm getting um, uh, uh, not knowing exactly the health issues that these people had. I'm not persuaded by this yet. One. And there was Forever Young by Dr. Stuart Berger, who loved corned beef sandwiches and champagne and died at 40. I was beginning to sweat because even reaching out to the low carb community didn't produce any 90 somethings. But then I caught a break. I discovered the website thinks.org, spelled with a C, the International Network of Cholesterol Skeptics. It appears to be abandoned with the copyright notice displaying 2014, but they have a public list of over 100 members, some of them best-selling authors. So Google and I went down the list, and it didn't look good at first. There was Peter Skrobinek, one of the founding members and author of Follies and Fallacies in Medicine, who died of prostate cancer at 53. Professor Michael Berger, who died at 58, and Joel Kaufman, who co-founded the site and wrote Malignant Medical Myths. He died at 78. But finally, I discovered Austrian physician Dr. Wolfgang Lutz, who wrote My Life Without Bread, which I was able to get on my Kindle. He had an epiphany when visiting cave paintings from France, and he concluded from the paintings that our natural diet must be mostly animals. Dr. Lutz allowed 72 grams of carbs per day, which was three Austrian white bread rolls. You could have one for each meal. But here's the kicker. Each roll was considered two bread units, 12 grams per unit, and he has a table of substitutions you could make. For example, pass on a half a roll, 12 grams, and you could have 200 grams of green beans, cabbage, or cauliflower, or a pint of beer, or two glasses of wine, or 120 grams of acid fruit like citrus or berries. Dr. Lutz wrote a book, Life Without Bread, but still allowed for some carbs, and lived in Germany, and it's still, I, are you really persuaded by this, by the, the lack of detail about how these people lived? That, that has me still questioning this logic, um, this, this uh, approach. The drinking man's diet from 1964 that was so popular. The guy who wrote it was none other than famed photographer Robert Cameron, and he lived to 98. So I bought a 50th anniversary edition of this thin little book. Robert didn't know anything about nutrition, but someone had handed him a list of 100 foods that were high in carbs and said, cut those and you'll lose weight. He did, and he went from 205 to 187 pounds. To make sure he wasn't missing something, he visited nutrition professor Agnes Faye Morgan at UC Berkeley, whom he described as slender. She said she had been on the equivalent of the drinking man's diet for 50 years, but she gave him a stark warning. She said, this is very important. You must have 60 grams of carbohydrates daily to stay healthy. She was adamant about this. Lack of the proper amount of carbohydrates will bring you to the unpleasant symptoms of a condition called ketosis. She lived to 80. Stop there. <laughs> well, every human goes into ketosis if you don't eat anything for two days or if you don't eat carbohydrates for two days. So again, I'm seeing through the lens of the old paradigm in many ways, and a lot of the vegan folks are stuck in the old paradigm, worrying about cholesterol and saturated fat and, and things like that. And um, so I'm not persuaded by reading a book from the old paradigm, uh, even though that was what the experts said at the time. Are you? He lived to 84, by the way, so Robert's meals included meat, poultry, and fish, fruits and vegetables, and drinks like martinis and wine, 
with every meal. He explained why. Well, this is an important thing in the keto world today. Alcohol has calories. Some of the alcohols have carbs. The, the beer, the wine has a little bit, but the hard liquors, while they don't have carbohydrates, they do have calories. And so you can actually get carbohydrate as calories or alcohol as calories, but that's not the nutrition you need, it's protein. Proteins come first. If you have animal proteins, you don't have to worry so much about getting complete protein. These are all the amino acids that we need. And, uh, but I don't recommend the drinking man's diet. Well, show me 50 people over six months, published in a peer reviewed journal, then I'll comment on it. Explain why he thought the diet worked. Instead of 400 grams of carbohydrates, we're now eating only 60. Incidentally, since every gram of carbohydrate means four calories, this represents a decline of over 1,350 calories in our daily diet, provided the total intake of proteins and fats remains the same. So after all this, I have 100 influencers on my timeline, and it's still not a good look for low-carb diets. Dr. Walter Longo, the respected longevity researcher from USC, cited some well-respected studies concluding that with the high... Well, well one thought occurs to me uh, seeing that picture is to a percentage game, not just a number, but if two out of 30 reached 100 or 90s, I think it was, what percent of all of the other, anyway, I don't, I don't see that kind of analysis coming. It's more like just, uh, you know, when did people die without regard to what really was happening to them. Including that with the high animal protein form of low carb diets, people were twice as likely to die of any cause. Yeesh, that's in the neighborhood of smoking. And four times as likely to die from cancer. But what do smart, well-educated advocates of low-carb diets say about this? If you've seen my previous episodes, you know I have a strong bias towards doctors and scientists with great credentials. And that led me to a book by doctors Westman, Finney, and Volek. I learned the Atkins diet has evolved and now... That's me. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Let's keep going. ...evolved and now has vegetarian and vegan options, but the book never addresses longevity. So I watch their speeches. One thing that jumps out at me is how low carb and vegan doctors are isolated in different conference bubbles with their own set of beliefs. I laugh when I try to imagine what supplement makers would try to sell if vegans and carnivores were at the same conferences. <laughs> um, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Wait a sec. Maybe it's the wrong Eric Westman. There, there's someone at the Karolinska who you can Google and you, it's, um, it's not me. It, there's another Eric Westman. Wait a second. Example is low carb influencers often talk about ancestral diets. And I often wish we could get a second opinion from career anthropologists. And I put up this picture because this is a photograph. We think it was taken around 1910. It was taken in uh, Northern Canada on the Arctic coast. Uh, we know that some of them lived to, to be 70 or 80 years old, so it wasn't a death-dealing diet. Honest. That's Steve Finney. I know Steve. In fact, he was a co-author on the new Atkins for A New You. Dr. Atkins had died in 2003, and so the Atkins company decided to have a new book and got three academics, that's Westman, Finney, Volick, to be the authors on the book. We kind of, um, how should I say, wrote it by committee, and there was someone who actually operationalized the writing of it. But uh, as best I can tell, Steve's still alive. Uh, but so uh, um, I guess what uh, I'm trying to say, uh, and he's pulling out Steve as being um, sort of a, a someone who doesn't know anything. No, Dr. Finney is one of the most knowledgeable people on earth in terms of nutrition. And uh, um, uh, I would love to have you, doctor, talk to Dr. Steve Finney. Of course, he is not out there on YouTube, and, and, uh, but um, he's is one of the most knowledgeable, pe knowledgeable people I've ever met on nutrition and medicine, going way back. His first study on the keto diet was in the 1980s, um, and um, still alive, I think. Well, wait, oh my God. <laughs> I wasn't looking for a poorly studied population whose elders live to 70 or 80 when we have populations all over the world that are thoroughly studied whose elders live past 100. So, time out. <laughs> to talk about people who lived in the Arctic Circle and how long they lived and comparing them to, best I could tell, the, the cherry-picked 
uh, diet about living, uh, you know, uh, as long as uh, the people who live to a hundred and, uh, oh, it's called the blues, the blue zones, I think. Yeah. But most of those people lived in warm climates and, and you couldn't slip on the ice, didn't have to deal with, with polar bears. And, and <laughs> anyway, um, so again, the, the context of how long you live and as being the, the kind of boiled down only variable you look at, I think is, is not really very sound. Unique distrust in the low carb community about large population studies and epidemiologists. I did find a low carb author, however, Rob Wolf, who gave a speech addressing one of the many large studies that concluded low carb diets shorten your life. Everybody and their cat jumped in on this thing, BBC, CNN, Newsweek, they quoted the study that really seemed pretty damning. This is the, the paper that came out, it was published in The Lancet, and when these things pop up, the folks in, in the community, um, we, we kind of get on an email chain and they're like, are you gonna take this bullet? You, you know, like who's gonna jump in and take the, the week or month out of their life to fully unpack this stuff? And, and Chris Kresser ended up drawing the short straw. That took some wind out of my sails because I wasn't looking to go all tobacco company on scientists to find weaknesses in their studies just to cast doubt. I was hoping he would point us to good studies about low carb dieters who lived long. Every other major diet has those, including vegans and Mediterranean diets and Okinawan dieters. But okay, let's hear Chris Kresser out. Like Rob Wolf, he's not a doctor or scientist, but he too is a low-carb book author. First point, I've been writing about health and nutrition for more than a decade now, and without fail, at least once a year a study like this is published. I could set my watch to it. Is that making the point that Chris wants to make? I'd be tempted to think, huh, if independent teams of scientists from around the world with impeccable credentials keep coming up with the same conclusions year after year, maybe they know things. Second point, repeat after me, correlation. Um, point, point is well taken, but the nutritional epidemiology, this is following people without really knowing what they're doing. I mean, you ask, uh, depending on which study, what people eat periodically. And then other lifestyle issues like smoking and, and other things that we think are useful and helpful to predict long-term outcome. The, the problem with the studies that come up every year, and, and I, I do know Rob Wolf, I've never met Chris Kresser. The problem with these studies is it gets into that low-carb-ish or, or keto-like kind of study. They, they'll take people, again, telling, uh, taking the word for what people say they're eating. They don't go home and watch them eat. Or they're r rarely measuring nutritional biomarkers that are based on what people are eating. So that you take the word for it and then you follow people over time. And uh, the low carb-ish, uh, usually it's under 30% of carbs. And of course that could include donuts and, and all sorts. It doesn't tell you about the dietary pattern. And thus, I'm one of the critics of the nutritional epidemiology points of, of, of view. And, and I don't think it's solid enough science to really make clinical recommendations from. And I know there are a lot of people who disagree with that, including Dr. Walter Willett, who created nutritional epidemiology, wrote the textbook. Um, if it's not great science and if it's not strong association, it's not meaningful. I'm sorry, we need prospective studies, ideally randomized, to really know, to isolate one particular variable. And again, I think there are a lot of ways to eat that are healthy. Keto is one of them because it lowers the glucose and insulin, changes the metabolic risk from small LDLs to high LDLs or high, um, uh, large LDLs, if, if you wanna use that language, uh, but, um, I'm afraid the nutritional epidemiologists, I, I, it's awkward now for me because out of Harvard, they've always found one particular outcome, which is, you know, fat's bad and, and ah, who knows about carbs. Although Frank Hu published a few papers that carbs were not so good either. But then enter in the McMaster group called the PURE study, P-U-R-E, and they're finding that the findings are different. Eating more fat's not so bad and eating carbs is what's bad. So there's the Harvard epidemiology and the McMaster nutritional epidemiology. Do, 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 do I use nutrition? No, 
I don't think we can use nutritional epidemiology because you're going to be always fraught with the assumptions about what people are eating. And we can do better than that. We can actually study diets like drugs and require studies to be done before medical approval, definitely. For me, it's before I use something in my clinic, I'm going to make sure there's research behind it. Is not causation. One of the key things to understand about observational studies is that you can't establish causation from observational studies. That does get repeated a lot in the low-carb community, but is it true? Epidemiology is heavy in statistics and probability theory, and I don't think Chris has a strong background in statistics and probability. And I yes, that's true. Correlation is not causation. Even with really, really high correlations. There are a lot of biases that can be introduced. Bias meaning um, something that takes you off the mark. So let's say you're trying to hit the bullseye. Bias means you, you aimed here, but you went here. It, it, it doesn't take you straight to the answer. Probably the most uh, common, uh, well, think about it. If people go to the hospital, they're more likely to die. Therefore, hospitals cause death. Well, and I've even heard some of my patients say, I don't want to go to the hospital because people die there. Well, people go there because they're sick. So that, that healthy user bias is huge in the diet world. People are doing other healthy things as confounders, um, and they don't have these other diseases that made them seek out a therapeutic sort of diet change. Uh, but no, correlation is not causation. You, you have to turn that around into a prospective experimental study. Congress commissioned the two celebrated epidemiologists to quantify the causes of cancer in America. No easy job when it would be unethical to expose study participants to cancer-causing substances in clinical trials. They combined the power of observational studies with statistics and probability to estimate that 30% of cancers come from tobacco, 35% come from lack of fruit and vegetables in the diet, and factors like environmental exposures contribute something like 4%. I've heard Professor Pito say it was hard to quantify the balance between smoking and lack of fruits and vegetables because few smokers eat fruits and vegetables, and the few that do eat some fruit have a 30% lower incidence of lung cancer. 35 years on, their estimates seem to be holding as generally true. That's very impressive. Strangely, the low-carb community dismisses epidemiologists when the rest of the nutritional community embraces them. For example, that's one of the reasons that the China study produced such high-quality data, because no <laughs> oh, no, not the China study. Oh, dear. So the strength of association matters. And I guess he's not going to say it. So I, I'll pull a figure down below where you can see the actual the tobacco. That was my former medical research area, helping people to quit smoking. Um, and the, to lump in these two content areas is... Um, disingenuous. It's just not, it's not, it's apples and oranges. None other than Richard Pito was one of its key co-authors. And of course, blogger Chris Kresser has tried to discredit that study as well. The rest of Chris's blog post about the Lancet study that showed increased mortality among low-carb eaters is interesting. He points out weaknesses in the study. All studies have them. Just ask the tobacco companies about Dole and Pito's studies. But it is useful to understand their limitations. Before COVID struck, I was invited to a Stanford MIT Brain Summit focused on Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And the organizing principle was that more often than not, scientific breakthroughs happen when the major disciplines collide. Neurology, biochemistry, psychology, data science, epidemiology, nutrition, etc. I think that if scientific disciplines like epidemiology and anthropology and the science of organizing large, multi-country, multi-decade, huge population studies were not locked out of the low-carb industry, we would have a lot more data to go by. My guess is we would find long-lived low-carb eaters who were healthy, but they would have moved towards plant-based sources of fats and proteins like avocados and nuts. And they would have moved away from animal sources of proteins because epidemiologists have been telling us for decades those are risky. My bet is the chart would look like... So, time out. <laughs> that long sentence started with, I think. No evidence, okay? <laughs> but let, let's see how put it all together. Uh, I'm not really being very, very persuaded here. Like this. The plant-based form of keto is probably the healthiest. The moderate protein, higher fat version like Finney, Volek, and Westman advocate is probably next. 
And the high animal protein version is probably what Walter Longo's studies show. Double the risk of dying of all causes and quadruple the risk of dying of cancer. Who really knows? Well, well, so let's stop there a minute. Uh, what, was he saying that these were okay? That they were probably better plant-based keto than... In fact, there was a study called Eco Atkins written by the, the Canadian researcher. And I thought that was odd that they put Atkins in the study title. Um, it's, that's the name, that's not a dietary pattern. But uh, so again, there's some plant-based bias there because the plant-based keto must be best. But then there was the Westman Finney Volick and uh, uh, in there as one of the healthier things. And then it went over to, I don't know, um, carnivore. Well, you know, there's a theme in the science that, that I learned. And that is, if you don't have a study yet, and, and, and in fact, if other if things look good, the absence of evidence is not proof that there's no effect. So since we haven't studied how long people can live on keto, it doesn't mean people can't live long on keto, although that's the inference that the, this doctor is trying to make. So that uh, we want to be very careful about the language uh, there are a couple animal studies, I don't value them too much, about putting different uh, rodents on different diets, living longer in one study, not as long uh, on a low-carb diet. I, I don't think that's very informative. So what you want to do is measure yourself. You can actually measure your metabolism, your, your, uh, your uh, vascular system, your arteries. That's what we're trying to prevent, and and of course cancer as well, inflammatory markers, and uh, you know I, I, there's a lot of um, overlap with sort of the the angsty, um, you know, no one gives you know the, or anti sort of the anti-establishment sort of thing from the vegan people and from the keto keto people. Is that real? I mean, people promote these kinds of diets, um, and uh, let, let's end up this one but I assume the processed food version of keto is probably the next worst. Wow, keto-friendly cereal. Wow, I wonder how many people understand those ingredients like allulose. Coconut keto clusters with brown rice syrup and cane sugar. Mmm, white keto bread. We've got resistant tapioca starch. How the heck is white bread even keto? And Atkins sells a line of ultra-processed foods with ingredients like milk isolates, polydextrose, and palm oil. And the carnivore version? Well, there's a guy who's healthy at 90 right now whose wife says he eats a ton of fruits and vegetables, and one of his quotes sticks with me. You've got to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Whether you're watching... Uh, I didn't get that last one. Oh, oh, I guess he thinks he's lucky, but he's really not, right? Um, well, so I have the same concerns, similar concerns about the keto junk foods that are out there. I don't endorse them. You need to be very careful when you look at a keto uh, food on the label. Great for keto diet, keto this, keto that. Well, you want to look at the nutrition facts label, look at total carbohydrates. And then, yeah, I share the concern. I look to see how many different uh, ingredients are in there. I'm afraid we're in the middle of a keto junk food response from industry. I don't know who's advising them about keto diets. I, I want you to eat regular, real food, not that sort of product-based keto, which, uh, again, I, I'm in agreement that we all have an anti-junk food uh, predilection in what we teach. And I think the commonality, if if there is one, and not the, 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 the type of foods, the commonality is we want to keep the blood sugar and the insulin low. And I'm not so persuaded about the cholesterol story anymore. I guess that's a different, the blood cholesterol, different story. Your body's going to make cholesterol if you don't eat it. If you reduce cholesterol you eat, your body's just going to make more. I don't think that's a bad thing. So uh, very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Mandel, for that. Um, and um, I hope it gives you a little more depth into understanding this kind of debate. Sometimes it seems to me a bit irrational with talking about people, how long they live without regard to where they lived and how they died. Uh, there probably was an era in the 60s and 70s when everyone was smoking 
if, if that's when the diet books were, were written, then, uh, you know, I, I think that's a big confounder that's been missed. Um, so the debate will continue. And, you know, I learned years ago that as long, if a news person can get one person to talk against something, suddenly it looks like it's a balanced sort of thing. And no, I, I, it's not. The science is marching forward on low carb keto diets in a, in a good way. Uh, the results seem really good, depending how you do it, of course. Till the next time. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And check out Adapter Life Academy.